what I'm here to, to talk about today, though, are, are the events of uh, what happened on 9-11-2001. On and certainly, as General Spitzenatic had indicated, a lot has happened since then. Uh, and 9-11-2001 uh, definitely was the day that, that essentially caused that transformation and, and, and changed the, the face of the Air National Guard and the Army National Guard uh, as we know it today. <clears throat> what I'll do is just briefly summarize um, uh, my activities on that day and, and how they, they, they terminated. Uh, on that day, I was uh, assigned here at the 119th Wing uh, as a pilot. Uh, came in on a, for a normal uh, training flight that day. I believe we were going to brief at uh, about uh, 7.30 in the morning, take off at 9 o'clock, fly a, a three-ship mission uh, to Boat Field to do a, a practice bombing mission, myself and, and two other pilots from the 119th. Uh, came in early, uh, as we do, uh, get a briefing together. Uh, and sometime in, in the interim, uh, again, got a... Uh, just a, a shout from uh, the, the lobby that uh, an aircraft had hit the, uh, the World Trade Center. Um, so came up and looked at it, saw the video on, I believe we were watching the Today Show at the time, and uh, saw the, uh, the smoldering tower. Uh, as pilots were looking at it, wondering how that could have happened on, a, again, a clear VFR day, much like we have, uh, have out here today, that you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty hard to accidentally fly into, into a building. Uh, I continued to watch that for a while, and then upon seeing the second aircraft hit, uh, it was like a horn went off or a switch hit, and everyone knew in instantly that, that this was uh, the first plane was not an accident, and certainly the second one was not an accident. Uh, at that time, uh, what I recall is a lot of people uh, spurred into action. Uh, our lift detachment at Langley was uh, sitting alert, and I remember phone calls being made there immediately, and the lines being, being busy. Uh, I remember... Um, people uh, scrambling to their workstations, trying to get more information. Uh, but again, there's a, an extreme sense of urgency from the moment the aircraft, second aircraft hit the towers at the wing to, to spur to action. Uh, at that time, we went back and, and started getting a recall roster calling, uh, calling pilots in. Uh, myself and my other flight members, uh, again, scrubbed the mission that we were on and started just preparing for what we knew was going to be a, a, a very long day at the wing. Somewhere uh, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the meantime, uh, a message came through that the uh, director of FEMA was having a, a conference in Missoula, Montana that was attended by uh, our then uh, Adjutant General, Major General Mike Haugen. And there was a call that uh, the director of FEMA, Mr. Joe Alba, needed to get back to, to Washington. And would, would, be, would we be able to dispatch a, an F-16 uh, two-seater to go and pick him up? And shortly thereafter, uh, a mission was detailed. I was sent back to the life support area, secured uh, the equipment necessary to get uh, Mr. Alba, Alba uh, equipped to fly in the F-16, helmet, uh, harness, uh, G-suit, flight suit, uh, those types of things. Uh, was quickly rushed out to the airplane, uh, waiting on the ramp, and launched. Uh, at the same time I got to the ramp, uh, again, a lot of activity was going on our, our ramp here uh, in Fargo. Aircraft were being towed out, uh, weapons were being loaded on airplanes, uh, uh, again, a very extreme sense of urgency as to, to what was transpiring. Uh, as I launched out uh, and was flying to Missoula, Montana, what I, what I noticed was uh, the, the lack of air traffic. And the few, few tra radio transmissions I, I were, was hearing were FAA officials telling aircraft to, to land immediately um, all around this part of the nation, uh, in South Dakota and in Montana, uh, ordering aircraft to the ground, uh, something I'd, I'd never heard, heard before. Uh, made a fairly <clears throat> uneventful flight into Montana, landed, uh, whereupon uh, was directed to an office where <clears throat> uh, Director Alba was with a large contingency of his staff, uh, also watching the television. In the, in the time between I took off and the time I, I've landed is when uh, approximately the, the Pentagon was hit and uh, the towers began falling. And again, uh, having, having been briefing and flying, I was kind of in an information void at the time, not knowing what actually was, was going on. And at that point, uh, when I landed, there was still the discussion of uh, there were up to, I believe at one time they were saying 21 airplanes or more that were potentially hijacked. So uh, in my mind, there was a, a very dire situation uh, occurring in the nation with a, an extreme sense of urgency to, uh, to get on with my mission and get going. Um, uh, while I was in Montana, a second military aircraft landed, a KC-135, immediately followed by a C-17. And at that time, it was decided that Mr. Alba should uh, take his staff that was with him and, and fly back to, to Washington collectively and, and use the size of the larger airplane to have a, a conference in flight. Uh, in the interim, uh, Secretary, uh, or the Director of Emergency Services from New York, uh, Mr. Ed Jacoby, uh, was 
was deemed necessary to get back to New York, and he became uh, the secondary passenger, which I ended up flying. As I said, General Haugen was uh, in Montana at the time, and he actually became the, the crew chief of my airplane, helping uh, Mr. Jacoby get uh, suited up in the airplane and, and strapped in and assisting in, in actually launching the airplane. So it was a, a bit of a, a twist of, of job positions there momentarily. Uh, we took off out of Montana. Uh, had some navigation uh, problems with the airplane, but uh, was able to uh, rendezvous with the tanker really almost directly over Fargo, air refueled, and proceeded on to uh, to New York to um, drop Mr. Jacoby. Uh, en route, uh, typically when you fly to the East Coast, there, there's a lot of radio chatter. Uh, if you don't hear something within a couple seconds, you, you start thinking that you've lost communication. Uh, but as I used the uh, onboard systems on the F-16 to interrogate other airplanes flying, there's a, a noticeable lack of airplanes, a noticeable lack of traffic. Uh, I found myself asking air traffic control for permission to, to climb and to, or descend or to, or to turn. Uh, finally, the FAA controller, frustrated with me, told me to do essentially whatever I wanted. I was the only airplane between uh, Seattle and uh, New York City. Uh, so at that point, it became, became fairly real that something was happening. Uh, I flew over Toronto. I remember looking down at the airport and seeing uh, numerous airplanes uh, just jammed up on, on the ramp uh, in, in parking spots with a lot of, uh, uh, again, uh, interrogation signals that their transponders are still on but, but parked on the ramp. Uh, again, Mr. Jacoby and I had a, a fairly lengthy discussion uh, en route, uh, one trying to keep him fairly calm as it was his first time flying in a, in a fighter aircraft with a, a helmet on and oxygen mask and uh, doing air refueling and, and a lot of uh, things I'm sure he was not accustomed to. Uh, but again, just talking about, uh, about, about the events that happened, trying to, to, to get some grasp of it, uh, talking about how this was going to uh, affect uh, really the nation as a whole. Uh, but again, trying to also keep him uh, fairly comfortable flying the airplane. We landed in New York City, uh, in the, or not, um, uh, in Albany, New York, uh, in the early evening, uh, at which time I dropped Mr. Jacoby off, refueled my airplane, and then I proceeded over uh, New York City, over Washington, and then to uh, Langley Air Force Base, where I spent the next uh, several days uh, uh, flying caps and uh, continuing on with the, uh, the mission. So that's just briefly my story. Uh, I, again, I believe it'll be Q&A afterwards, so I'll pass it on to uh, Colonel Derrick.